Good morning once again. For those who uh, I've not yet met this morning, uh, my name is Steve Ferguson. I'm the pastor here at Southport Heights and so very glad that you're here with us today. As you can tell by our worship service, the thing that we want to do more than anything around here is celebrate Jesus. And so uh, it's a great, great day to do that. I want what God wants. Do you? Do I? We say we do, but let me give you a quick illustration of how this works. A mother was preparing pancakes for her two young sons, Kevin and Ryan, and the boys began to argue who would get the first pancake. The mother saw this as an opportunity for a parenting moment. So she said, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let your brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Kevin turned to his younger brother and said, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> Is that not kind of how our mind works? Simple question. Is it hard not getting what you want? Is it hard not getting what you want? Folks, this is what we're talking about in this series in a nutshell. Wanting what God wants more than what I want. Let's face it, sometimes we just want the first pancake. And that's how we see it. Well, as we conclude our message series on I want what God wants, the only way to accomplish that heart and head mission of wanting what God wants is through prayer. And so as we conclude this series, we're going to be talking about prayer today. And with me, I have a uh, friend of mine. Some of you have seen him. He sits back there behind that wall of drums. Uh, this is Brian Price. And Brian's come to me and uh, Derek and started talking about some things that he's learned about prayer. And so Come on over, Brian, and share with us. This morning, the first thing, i uh, just going to ask him a quick question, and that's what have you learned in the past several months about prayer? Um, the, the main thing I've learned, um, and this has been a big discussion point with Derek when he and I have been meeting, um, is that the reason we pray a lot of times has become lost. Um, a quick question, how many of you have prayed for healing for your family, for a job promotion, anything like that, something tangible that you can get. Mm -hmm. God wants you to bring those things to him, but it so often becomes a Christmas list for Santa of like, okay, well here's, I want this and then I want this and then I want this and we lose sight of what we're doing. We're having a conversation with God. He wants us to lift those things to him, but he knows our heart. He knows our thoughts. He's going to do what he is going to do. We just need to lift things to him and, and thank him. Our prayers too often are not thanking God for what he has already done for us, thanking him mm -hmm. for his mercy, for his grace, for his love, for his power for the food on our table, for the chance to worship. And that's what we need to bring prayer back to. And so how's what you've learned impacted you on a personal level? I've struggled a lot with this and that's why I approached Derek probably a month ago maybe um, about him and I meeting to discuss my faith, the struggles that I'm having, prayer, and um, what I've learned is I have a long way to go. <laughs> um, but I've also come a long way. Yeah. And through discussion, through Bible plans on the Uversion app, I've gone through, I think, over 10, most of them uh, with Derek over the last few weeks, uh, where we can really read and discuss together, even when we're not actually together. 
what we need to do when we pray, how to pray. And it starts with thanking God and trying to do that daily. And I have not always been successful with that. <laughs> um, and that's why I say I have a long way to go. As we all do. Thanks, Brian. What I heard Brian say was it begins with prayer and it ends with prayer. But sometimes not to pray the way, as he mentioned, the way we have in the past. You see, I think as we're talking about prayer today, we've got to understand that prayer is the linchpin that makes obedience possible. Think about that for a moment. It's the linchpin that makes obedience possible. The other day, I read some examples of young kids attempts to say the Lord's Prayer. I thought they were kind of cute, so I'm going to share some with you. Reese, a three-year-old prayed, Our Father, who does art in heaven, Howard is his name. A four-year-old prayed, And forgive us our trash baskets, as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. I think there's some truth to that one. Three-year-old Caitlin had practiced the Lord's Prayer with her father. She repeated it every night until she said to dad one night that she was ready to do it on her own and everything was going great until the end. And she said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us some email. <laughs> As you listen to those, I just think prayer can be challenging as a kid, can it not? It's just challenging for children to pray. And it doesn't seem to get much easier for us, does it? I gotta tell you, that's the way I felt about my prayer life for a long time. I spent many, many hours posturing for prayer, but I never was really praying until I learned that the purpose of prayer was to change me. Then I began to have a fulfilling prayer time. But the simple question is how many of us really want to change? How many of us really want to change? Most of us are very comfortable in our skin and so we don't want to, oh no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to make that change. And I want to tell you what, there are moments in life when it's not just enough to pray. We have to pray through. I hope you understand what I'm saying there. We have to pray through. Everybody, I want to say that with me. Say, I got to pray through. Say that, pray through. Because many times we'll pray and we're done. But we need to pray through. Because listen, if obedience were easy, everybody would do it. Wouldn't they? If everybody liked it, we would do it. Obedience would be simple. And we can talk about obedience all day long, but the truth is when obeying God seems the hardest, it's only prayer that keeps us committed to what God wants rather than what I want. Maybe what God wants for you to do is to turn the other cheek. And nothing inside of you wants to put up with the sub or subject yourself to something that's going to hurt you again. It's only prayer that allows you to obey. April 16th, 1963. Martha Luton, uh, Martha, <laughs> easy for you to say. Martin Luther King. I got it. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote his famous letter from Birmingham. 13 days earlier, he and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights started their nonviolent protest with coordinated marches and sit-ins to fight against segregation and racial justice in Birmingham, Alabama. And which Judge Jenkins ruled against demonstrating on April the 10th, it only took two days for King and his leaders to be arrested and jailed. And while in jail, 
King wrote about the personal struggle of forgiving those police officers who had, and they still were, assaulting his followers outside the jail with nightsticks and calling them all kinds of profane names. King wrote that he had to fast several days to find the supernatural strength to, a, to be able to forgive the offenders. On his own, he couldn't compel himself to forgive. He needed God's help. And the way that he got God's help was through prayer. Maybe, maybe we're like king today. We're needing to love our enemies. Or maybe we need to forgive someone. Maybe you need to trust God for a miracle that seems beyond impossible. You see, there are all kinds of areas in our life that we need help trusting and obeying God. And the strength that it requires to obey God is only found in that secret place of praying through. Mother Teresa, I think most of us know that name. This is what she said. Prayer is not asking. Prayer is putting oneself in the hands of God at his disposition and listening to his voice in the depth of our hearts. She just put it in different words what David said in Psalm chapter 62, verse 8, when he said, oh, my people trust in him, being God, at all times. Pour your heart to him, for God is our refuge. You see, praying through is a process of pouring our, house, our hearts out in confession to God and admitting, listen, admitting the doubts and the selfishness and allowing God to fill us with peace. And we look in Philippians, it's a peace that passes all understanding. And that's what we need. We need a peace that passes all understanding. You pray. You pray until the moment that you can say, I want what God wants more than what I want. Can I be honest with you today? I'll be on my knees a long time to make that happen. Because I'm selfish. I want what I want when I want it and how I want it. And I'm going to guess that I'm not the only one in the room that thinks like that. I think we all have that within us because we're human, because we're in a fallen world. That's how we think. But let me, even Jesus had to pray through. Let me, let me uh, share a promise with you. If Jesus had to pray his way to obedience then we will too. Listen, imagine knowing the purpose of your life before you were even born. And imagine living your life for the sole purpose that you were always aware of. And the night of your destiny, as it awaits you, you start getting cold feet. That's where Jesus found himself on his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the greatest heavyweight battle of wills that the world has ever seen. Matthew chapter 26. We're going to begin in verse 36. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch, uh, keep watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? And he asked, that's what he asked Peter. 
Watch and pray so that you will not fall into, into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away once more and he prayed the third time saying the same thing. Have you ever watched Bob Ross painting on TV? I've had that privilege a few times because of uh, the lady I'm married to and her artistic talents. You know who he is, right? You know who Bob Ross is? Or am I? Okay. He had a painting show that was on PBS stations. And if you ever watched him paint, you know how he worked. For the first 25 minutes, the canvas looked like a mess. He would take different colors and paint abstract shapes that didn't look like anything, but all of a sudden he would take a small brush or his finger and with one little stroke, the painting would all come together. And a green mess with one little addition would turn into a beautiful forest or a gray blob became a breathtaking mountain and you would see the picture crystal clear. I think God works the same way. I think that's how God is if I look at him as a painter. There's been a few times, very few times in my life that I've been able to recognize God's work in progress. I've been able to recognize it while I was in the middle of it. Or I've been able to see the instruction of God that seemed so trivial or it seemed too stinking difficult. Right? My problem is, I want to see the finished product before I agree to participate. Anybody with me there? You want to see the end before you start, don't you? You don't want to step out into the water out of that boat until you know that yeah, I'm going to hold Jesus' hand and walk onto the shore. We want to know the end before we begin. It's not how God works. If I agree to take the first step and trust him by the time he's finished, he's gonna produce something that's absolutely incredible. And when we look back, what's the saying? Hindsight is? And when you look back after something God's done in your life, you can see it. You can see how his hand was involved the whole time. It's always obvious when we're looking back, but it scares me to death when I'm looking forward. Philip Yancey, love his writings, he said this, faith is believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. I love that because that's me. I gotta look back. But you see, the Bible's filled with masterpieces, men and women whose canvases took a lifetime to complete. To an onlooker, the first 80 years of Moses' life looked like dogs playing poker. Rather than the Mona Lisa. Joseph had to wait 22 years for his paint to dry. Betrayal and abandonment were just some of God's, all, <laughs> some of God's color choices. And each fork of the road, Joseph had to recommit to God's path, even when it wasn't clear where he was going. Now, in full disclosure this morning, I am in no way, shape, or form a painter. I don't even paint walls. <laughs> I hate painting. The artist and painter in my family is sitting down front and she's tremendous at it. I'm the guy who, with my wife, we're in Brown County and we're sitting, or we're going through, or going through an art museum. Guess who was so happy about that? <laughs> but we're going through that art museum and I'm standing behind my wife and she's looking at these pictures and I'm, I'm trying to understand what's going on. I don't get it. 
I don't look at it. She can look at it and tell me everything that's going on, everything that's happening. And I don't see it. As a matter of fact, one time we're standing looking at a picture, and I think the picture, it was like $1,500 or something. And I looked at her and I said, how long would it take to paint that? A couple hours. Start painting. <laughs> you know, when I started thinking about God as an artist, and my life as a canvas, my outlook and my perception changed. I began to reread some of those Bible stories that I love. I'd read them a hundred times. But this time I just kind of envisioned God with his artist brush making strokes. Think about it. What if every verse of hopelessness and darkness and doubt is just God, the artist, using dark colors to add to his masterpiece? And what if every verse of blessing and victory are bright colors bringing splash into the art? You see, I'll bet these verses we read in Matthew set the stage for an incredible piece of art. Jesus knelt down to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the night that he was going to be arrested and killed. And as he began to pray, the knowledge of God's plan and his natural desires to want his view over what was best for him. Listen, that was so grueling that he began to sweat drops of blood. It was as if God at that moment, painting the greatest masterpiece ever, was brushing the top of the canvas with red paint and it began to drip slowly down. Three different times, Jesus begged God to come up with a new plan. But God didn't budge. And I don't know about you this morning, but me, I am very glad that God didn't budge. I'm glad that he knows what's best, even when I'm convinced that my plan is much better. You know what I love about this honest, vulnerable look into the prayer life of Jesus during his most difficult time on this earth isn't as much about the outcomes as just the honest dialogue. He was begging his father to change his plan. God knows how you feel. God knows what you're going through. So why don't you tell him when you're praying? God, right now, I'm a mess. And God's in, check. He knows. God, I'm really upset right now. I want this, but you're doing this. I don't get it. You need to tell God how you feel when you pray. He's big enough to handle it. Sometimes we're afraid to tell other people how we feel because we don't want to hurt their feelings. God can handle anything that you want to throw at him. Abraham Lincoln said this. I have, to be driven many to, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. Listen. You need to tell God how you feel when you pray. And I'm going to tell you that venting is part of praying. It's part of prayer. Talking about the anger that you're dealing with or the sadness or the anxiety or the disappointment or the worry or the joy. Fear should be a part of our prayer life. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 in the New Living Translation says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called what? Wonderful counselor. He can handle it. And he will tell you what you need to do. He is not going to sugarcoat it. 
And he's not going to be, you're not going to get a trophy unless you come in first place. Right? God's not going to give you a trophy just because you showed up. You got to run the race. And you got to run the race to win. I heard somebody say just this two weeks ago, I heard this. Prayer is the best counseling session money can buy. I like that because I believe it to be true. I believe that to be true. But here's the other thing about prayer. Silence is prayer. Silence is prayer. Martin Luther said when he was in the jail in 1963, he said, the fewer the words, the better the prayer. Oh, I like that. You ever been on your knees? So distraught, you had no idea what to say. Do you think God knew what was on your heart? Do you think God knew what you were gonna say if you could? The Spirit intervenes and takes all those utterings right to him. So he knows exactly where you are and what you're thinking and what you're feeling. Silence is wonderful sometimes. Silence is wonderful a lot. In your house. Gandhi said this. Prayer is not asking. Let's go back to what Brian shared with us. Prayer is not asking. It's a longing of the soul. It's a daily admission of one's weakness. It is better in prayer to have a heart without words than to have words without a heart. Gandhi is a pretty smart man, wasn't he? Jesus prayed according to the text that we read for an hour. But all we have is one line. One line that he prayed. My guess, and I am no theologian by any stretch of the imagination, but my guess is that he prayed that one line over and over and over. And there's probably some long periods of silence in between when he was asking God to change his mind. Because he, he was thinking about what was gonna happen. And so he would pray, God change it, and then he would be silent. But in his silence, what's going on in his mind? Just what he said. When God spoke to Elijah, when he was on the mountain, the English version translated that God spoke with a gentle whisper. But the original Hebrew translates silence can be heard. You ever heard the phrase, silence is deafening? You ever heard that? Oh, it's so quiet in here, that silence is deafening. That's what it is. Can I just share what I think most of our problem is when it comes to prayer? We don't shut up. We think it's a one-way street. We think it's us talking to God. And as Brian said, it's usually when we have our Christmas list. And we ask and we ask and we ask. When we would be much more benefited if we would just close our mouths and listen. Here's another thing about prayer. Pray until you have peace. Pray until you, listen, it took Jesus three times. You pray until you have peace. And if you start to lose that peace, what are you gonna do? Start praying again until you get that peace. Sometimes we need to pray hourly because I'm not getting that peace. You got a major decision to make in your life. You pray and you pray and you pray and you never get a peace about it. Keep praying. Because until you get the peace, you're not done. We need to pray until we get the peace. Whenever 
we feel anything other than peace slipping, go back to praying. I want what God wants. The only way that that's ever going to be a truth in my life is by praying. And it's going to be by praying through. Not praying once. Maybe not even praying a hundred times. But praying until I have the peace to know that in my being, in the core of my being, I want what God wants. And I'm willing to go the direction that he wants to take me.